What happened at Woodford could have direct consequences for you as an investor, and that's because it teaches us some broad lessons about liquidity. So, for example, if you invest in the peer-to-peer -peer market in the UK, that's a very illiquid asset, just like some of the equity that was in Woodford's funds. So it could be that those funds get gated if we have a shakeout in that sector here in the UK. Now, to learn exactly what happened at Woodford and the four lessons that I think we can learn from it, let's see that in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. Let's go over what's happened with Woodford in the recent past. This is his potted biography, and all the trouble started since he left Invesco and started up Woodford Investment Management, and that was in 2014. While he was at Invesco, he was seen as a star manager. The performance of his perpetual income fund is shown in blue, versus the broader UK Equity Income Index in red. His fund returned an average of 12%, whereas his peers returned an average of 7.9%. And although that doesn't sound much, over decades it compounded to a very significant difference. And following that success, he clearly thought he could reproduce it with his own shop. And this generated huge amounts of interest in the media. As this article from Hargreaves Lansdowne said in 2014, his primary skills were as a stock picker, looking for companies which he thought were undervalued and which had the ability to generate large amounts of cash. Woodford has three funds. The first one, which is the cause of all the problems recently, is the equity income fund. As I warned in my review of Woodford, this fund is inherently riskier than the income focus fund. And that's because of its exposure to small emerging companies, which don't have a proven track record. And these companies tend to be very illiquid, which has caused a lot of these problems, as we'll see later. I've shown the performance of the fund in black, and I've compared it with the FTSE All Share in blue. And you can see that the fund has been on a downward path since early 2017. The Income Focus Fund, which hasn't been gated, doesn't buy these small illiquid companies. It only invests in established companies. But even that is underperforming compared to the FTSE All Share. And finally, Patient Capital is structured as an investment trust. And one of the benefits of that is that it's closed-ended, which means that when people pull out their money, Woodford doesn't have to sell the assets. So he won't run into these liquidity problems. But even so, the price of the Patient Capital Trust fell very sharply on news of the gating of the Equity Income Fund. Once the return on his fund started to wane, large fund managers pulled out their money quite quickly, starting with Jupiter in October 2017 and including Aviva in November 2017. Then in June 2019 came the announcement that it was going to suspend dealing in shares in the Equity Income Fund. What seems to have triggered the final decision was the Kent County Council, which had almost a quarter of a billion invested in the fund, was told it couldn't pull out its money. And a spokesperson from the council said that that decision was disappointing. The reason for the suspension was to allow time for Woodford to sell the illiquid contents of the portfolio over a reasonable period of time, about a month. And by spreading out the trades, he'll probably get a better price for the assets than he would if he had to sell them in a fire sale. Because market makers would probably know what he was going to sell and drop the prices accordingly. Then once he'd unloaded his stock, they'd raise the prices and sell at a very significant profit. Once this announcement was made, the companies which had supported Woodford and strongly promoted his funds very rapidly withdrew their support. That included St James's Place, for whom Woodford was managing $3.5 billion in funds. And there were calls from Treasury Committee Chair Nicky Morgan, but also Hargreaves Lansdowne, that Woodford shouldn't charge a management fee while the equity income fund was suspended. So what is gating and why would it affect your investments? Imagine we set up a fund to buy some illiquid assets. Those are assets which take a very long time to buy and sell. And property is a typical illiquid asset. So initially we get a couple of investors who put money into the pot and we use that to buy one factory. As more investors put in their money, we can buy a second property. And if the fund is successful and generates good returns, we'll probably get more money through the door and we can carry on buying more property. But if there's a crash in the property market, then the value of the fund will fall sharply 
and investors will inevitably start to pull out their money. If it's just a few investors pulling out their money, we may have enough spare cash in the fund to pay them off. But if many investors start to pull out at the same time, we've got a problem. We just can't have enough cash to pay them off. In order to do that, we'd have to sell some of our property. And that can take a very long time. So what usually happens is that the fund gets gated, which means people can't pull out their money for some fixed period of time. During that time, we'll sell the property for cash. And this may take some time. Then we remove the gate on the fund and pay off the investors that wanted to pull out. So the key thing to understand is that liquidity is related to the time to sell an asset. If you're selling shares, that usually just takes seconds. But there are lots of assets which take much longer to sell, particularly in a crisis, which is exactly when you want to sell them. So now let's turn to the lessons we can learn from what's happened to Woodford. The first one, I think, is liquidity risk is very real. What kind of assets are illiquid? In other words, which ones take a very long time to sell? Well, we've already talked about real estate, but alternative assets are also very difficult to sell because there's no ready market for them. And that might include things like vineyards, stamps or wine, and the very popular peer-to-peer -peer loans that you get for peer-to-peer -peer lenders. And in the more traditional financial markets, high yield credit is another asset which is very illiquid. Sometimes several days go by during which a single bond isn't even traded. And if you want to dump a very large amount of high yield credit bonds, it can take quite a while. But thanks to financial engineering nowadays, you can wrap these illiquid assets in a very liquid wrapper, like an exchange traded fund. Or alternatively, an open ended investment company, which is a mutual fund. That means you can sell the liquid wrapper very quickly. But if there's a crisis, it may mean that the fund manager can't sell the assets quickly enough to pay off their investors. And that can lead to these problems that we saw with Woodford. The key thing to remember is that during a crisis, and in particular a liquidity crisis for an asset, the liquidity of the fund reduces to the liquidity of its least liquid assets. In other words, the liquidity disappears. And that's what leads to this unpleasant but necessary process, which is called gating. So if you're really into peer-to-peer -peer lending, beware that that might happen to your peer-to-peer -peer fund as well. Lesson two is about best buy lists. At best, they're unhelpful. Of course, I can understand why they're necessary. For example, if you look at how many exchange-traded funds are available, there are over 4,000 out there, and you have to make sense of them and decide which ones to buy, which can be very daunting for people just starting out in investment. But it took suspension of dealing in Woodford Equity Income to make Hargreaves Lansdowne take the fund off its Wealth 50 list, which is its list of favourite funds. But Hargreaves must have known about the illiquidity problems well before the fund was gated. Following the gating, in their statement about Woodford, Hargreaves were at pains to point out that they never take payment or commission for funds to appear on the Wealth 50. They base decisions about inclusion only on performance potential. And their justification of the list is that it produces better deals for their clients, which number over a million people. Terry Smith, who manages the very successful Global Equity Fund, is quite bitter about being excluded from the Wealth 50. He says that to get onto the Wealth 50 list, fund managers have to comply with the charging structure which is imposed by Hargreaves Lansdowne. And this structure, he says, is designed to maximise Hargreaves' own profitability and is not designed to choose funds that perform best for investors. And as Kate Beerley pointed out in the FT, there seems to be a conflict of interest because Hargreaves had exclusive access to a cheap share class which they negotiated with Woodford on behalf of their clients. And as a result, Woodford received large amounts of capital funneled into his fund by the marketing machine of Hargreaves Lansdowne. And a rival broker that tried to negotiate a similar deal on their platform said that Woodford refused to do so unless they could guarantee at least $500 million invested in his fund. As a result of this special deal between Hargreaves and Woodford, the holdings of Hargreaves' clients of Woodford funds are very significant. CityWire showed that Hargreaves' Lansdowne clients owned a whopping 38% of Woodford equity income in 2015, 
that was a holding of over three billion. And in the case of the Woodford Income Focus Fund, Hargreaves' clients owned about two thirds of the seven hundred million pounds invested in the fund. And the benefit of the deal to Woodford is very clear. CityWire estimates that he would have made about fifty million pounds in fees just from Hargreaves' Lansdowne clients over a space of three years. So when you see these best buy lists, like the Wealth 50, always consider who's going to benefit. If there's any kind of financial incentive, and it doesn't have to be direct in the form of commission, it can just be indirect in the form of getting people to buy stuff which you've marketed, consider whether that's best for you, or consider whether the list is created to generate more business for the company and greater profits. Lesson three is that the alpha cult is dying. What's alpha? Well, it's the outperformance of active managers above that of the market. That's why you pay them more than you would with a passive fund, which simply tracks the overall market. You pay them for alpha. You pay them for outperformance. You never really know you're in a cult because the ideas are so pervasive. And the alpha cult is no different. The assumption, which is held by very large numbers of people, is that certain people, either because they're really clever or they have huge resources, can choose assets which are going to give better returns than the market. And because of this skill, they can consistently outperform over decades. And the second critical part of the alpha cult is that you can find those people. And the only way to do that is to look at their past performance. And once you've found them, you give them your money, pay them a fee, and they'll beat the market. And this belief is so pervasive, despite the fact that it disappoints repeatedly. And the pattern is as follows. You get some active fund that outperforms for some period of time, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years like Woodford. Then money journalists pick up on the story. They praise the manager, hail them as a genius who has the secret source. Platforms which publish research, like Hargreaves Lansdowne, market the fund through their research articles. Then mom and pop investors put their money into the fund because they believe the journalists and they believe the research. And then the fund starts underperforming and people pull out their money. Ask yourself a simple question. Why isn't there a single fund in the UK which has outperformed the market for two decades? You can bet if there was one, we'd all be hearing about it. The Alpha Cult has its own gravy train. In other words, there's a whole industry built around this belief that fund managers can outperform the market. Active fund managers are a gift for investment banks and brokers because they trade in huge size, because they have so much money to invest. And that flow of trades keeps investment banks and brokers in business. And there are many research companies, often investment banks themselves, which produce company analysis. These are reports which describe each individual stock, which is supposed to help stock pickers find the stocks which are going to outperform. But of course, if you say that a company is good or bad, that's going to stimulate trading amongst those who read the report. So the question is whether that's research or just marketing designed to increase the number of trades and boost the revenue for brokers. And as we've seen, we also get this kind of research, which is actually just marketing from platforms like Hargreaves Lansdowne, but also others. And it might be that the purpose of this research is simply to funnel money into these funds and to stimulate trading. And some, but certainly not all, financial advisors recommend expensive active funds. Perhaps this is because it's hard to justify a very high fee for financial advice if all you're doing is putting money into extremely cheap passive funds, which your clients could do for themselves. And the problem with these deals where you get discounted share classes is that it makes platforms sticky. If you've got the discounted Woodford share class, then if you switch platform, you'll have to pay more money for that same product. So in a sense, it's anti-competitive. I've done an interview with Andrew Innes of S&P on the index versus active report, which looks in detail to see how many funds outperform their index. In other words, which ones manage to generate alpha. And the vast majority of the funds simply don't. So the alpha cult is based on a false belief. So lesson four is that the alternative to the alpha cult, which we can think of as the bogle cult, is growing, as the message about active management failing is getting through. 
and we can quickly rattle through the 10 beliefs on which Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, based his beliefs about investments. Firstly, live below your means. That means you'll have money to invest. Secondly, invest as early as you can and invest often because compound interest has the potential to generate large returns over the long term. Too much risk or too little risk is a bad thing. So if you can, take more risk when you're young and less as you get older. And there's more about that in my video on target retirement funds. Spread your money as widely as you can geographically across sectors. In other words, don't put it all into tech stocks and split it across different asset types as in shares and bonds. People sometimes hold back their money because they're worried about a crash. But generally these crashes are unpredictable. So don't hold back your cash because you can't predict the crashes. Index funds, which just track a market, are very cheap and are probably going to do better than an expensive active fund. Fees compound just like returns, so you should have an obsessive focus on keeping your costs as low as possible. 1% per year in fees doesn't sound like much, but over a lifetime, the difference it makes to your investment performance can be staggering. Use tax-efficient wrappers if you can. In the UK, we've got ISAs and we've got SIPs. Keep it simple. Don't buy 100 funds. Bogle suggests using just two. And yes, I've got a video on how to build a two-fund portfolio. And finally, stay the course. Keep at it whatever happens in markets, whether they're rallying hard or whether they're crashing. Investment can be terrifying, but stick with it. So the alpha cult in the UK is finally dying, or is it? Well, if you want to learn about that or any other investment topic, why not join us on Patreon? I depend completely on your support. I don't take payment from fund managers or from fund platforms like Hargreaves Lansdowne or Woodford, so I rely completely on you. For just $5 a month plus VAT, you can join my community. You can join us on a Sunday evening to discuss any question you like about investment. You can join our Slack channel. And it's a very friendly environment in which you can learn how to invest for yourself. If you pay $15 a month, you get a one-to-one -one session with me every other month and you can discuss anything you like. But I never offer financial advice. I offer financial education. Just bear that in mind. So as always, thank you for listening.